Breakfast was not yet ready when we were alarmed by the discharge of a number of guns that seemed to be near. Mother almost fainted at the report, and everyone trembled with fear. On opening the door, the man and horse lay dead near the house, having just been shot by the Indians. I was afterwards informed that the Indians discovered him at his own house with his gun and pursued him to father's, where they shot him as I have related. They first secured my father and then rushed into the house and without the least resistance made prisoners of my mother, Robert, Matthew, Betsy, the woman and her three children, and myself, and then commenced plundering. The party that took us consisted of six Indians and four Frenchmen, who immediately commenced plundering, as I just observed, and took what they considered most valuable, consisting principally of bread, meal, and meat. Having taken as much provision as they could carry, they set out with their prisoners in great haste. On our march that day, an Indian went behind us with a whip, with which he frequently lashed the children to make them keep up. In this manner, we traveled till dark without a mouthful of food or a drop of water, although we had not eaten since the night before. Whenever the little children cried for water, the Indians would make them drink urine or go thirsty. At night, they encamped in the woods without fire and without shelter, where we were watched with the greatest vigilance. Extremely fatigued and very hungry, we were compelled to lie upon the ground supperless and without a drop of water to satisfy the cravings of our appetites. As in the daytime, so the little ones were made to drink urine in the night if they cried for water. At the dawn of day, we were again started on our march in the same order that we had proceeded on the day before. About sunrise, we were halted and the Indians gave us a full breakfast of provision that they had brought from my father's house. Each of us being very hungry, partook of this bounty of the Indians. Our repast being finished, we again resumed our march, and, before noon, passed a small fort that I heard my father say was called Fort Kanagojigi. Towards evening, we arrived at the border of a dark and dismal swamp, which was covered with small hemlocks or some other evergreen and other bushes into which we were conducted. And having gone a short distance, we stopped to encamp for the night. As soon as I had finished my supper, an Indian took off my shoes and stockings and put a pair of moccasins on my feet, which my mother observed. And believing that they would spare my life, even if they should destroy the other captives, addressed me as near as I can remember in the following words. My dear little Mary, I fear that the time has arrived when we must be parted forever. Your life, my child, I think will be spared, but we shall probably be tomahawked here in this lonesome place by the Indians. Oh, how can I part with you, my darling? Oh, how can I think of your being continued in captivity without a hope of your being rescued. Oh, that death had snatched you from my embraces in your infancy. The pain of parting then would have been pleasing to what it is now, and I should have seen the end of your troubles. May God bless you, my child, and make you comfortable and happy. The Indian led us some distance into the bushes or woods, and there lay down with us to spend the night. The recollection of parting with my tender mother kept me awake while the tears constantly flowed from my eyes. Early the next morning, the Indians and Frenchmen that we had left the night before came to us, but our friends were left behind. It is impossible for anyone to form a correct idea of what my feelings were at the sight of those savages, whom I supposed had murdered my parents and brothers sister and friends, and left them in the swamp to be devoured by wild beasts. But what could I do? 
a poor little defenseless girl, without the power or means of escaping, without a home to go to, even if I could be liberated, without a knowledge of the direction or distance to my former place of residence, and without a living friend to whom to fly for protection. I felt a kind of horror, anxiety, and dread that to me seemed insupportable. My only relief was in silent, stifled sobs. My suspicions as to the fate of my parents proved too true, for soon after I left them, they were killed and scalped, together with Robert, Matthew, Betsy, and the woman and her two children, and mangled in the most shocking manner.' 